Clever Hans was a horse that was taught to count by his owner, or so it would seem. But surprisingly, this wasn't a simple case of fraud, where the owner tricked people into thinking that his horse could count. No. Instead, this is a case of a horse tricking humans. Allow me to explain. Hans was taught to count, or so he would have us believe, by a Prussian school teacher named Herr Wilhelm von Austin, who was between 60 and 70 years of age. In the years leading up to 1904, Herr Wilhelm von Oddball would frequently give lessons to Hans in full view of his neighbors, who would watch on in bewilderment as Wilhelm would draw diagrams on a chalkboard for the horse, fervently describing numbers, letters, and the sorts of things that a young child might learn between recess and nap time. Hans was rewarded during these learning sessions with bread, carrots, and the occasional lump of sugar. Over time, Hans was trained to stomp his foot in response to questions. Eventually, a system was put in place where Hans stomped a number of times corresponding to an answer. The questions that he answered in this way ranged from simple to very complex. He was sometimes asked about days of the week, mathematical operations, and questions concerning letters of the alphabet, colors, playing cards, and even music. Here are some specific example questions that Hans was asked. How much is two-fifths plus one-half? What is this woman holding in her hand? Between what figures is the small hand of a watch at five minutes after half-past seven? Hans, now cleverer after several years of schooling under Mr. Von Austin, went on to perform for audiences, who delighted to watch a horse, of all people, stomp out the answers to their questions. But because Clever Hans was a horse, a horse, of course, of course, people were suspicious that it was a trick. And they were right, but not in the way that they expected. So how was Clever Hans accomplishing these miraculous feats with his miraculous feats? <laughs> Hang on a second, I have to go promote and then fire my writing staff. The first hint comes from the fact that Hans was sometimes able to answer questions without them being asked out loud. Mr. Von Austin claimed that the horse had such sensitive hearing that if a person thought their question while their mouth and or nose were slightly open, the horse could hear it. Oh, so the horse was a mind reader, eh? Nay. Another clue came from the fact that sometimes Hans wouldn't answer questions correctly. This sometimes happened when it was dark out, when the questioner didn't know the answer to their own question, and especially when Hans couldn't see the questioner directly. This led a sciencey science man named Oscar Funkst to conclude that something Funksty was going on. He had a hunch that it was the body language of the humans that Hans was depending on to be all clever-like. To test this hypothesis, Mr. Funkst, assisted by other interested gentlemen, spent more than a month investigating Hans, mostly with Mr. Von Austin's permission. I say mostly because Mr. Von Austin often interrupted the experiments, which is one of the reasons why it took more than a month to draw a conclusion. Other reasons include the fact that Hans sometimes bit the experimenters. So what kind of experiments did they conduct on this so-called clever horse? Well, he almost certainly was a horse. It was really just the clever part that was so-called. Although two dudes in a horse costume would also explain a lot. They conducted a series of alternating trials where the question asker knew the answer to half of the questions and those were interspersed with the other half of the questions that they didn't know the answer to. Here's an example chart showing one such group of trials. They used some clever ways to determine what Hans was capable of. They used numbers written on cards that were shown to Hans, who tapped the correct answer written on the card just 8% of the time when the experimenter didn't know what was written on the card, but he got it right 98% of the time when the experimenter did know what number was on the card. In my personal favorite example, an experimenter would whisper a number into Hans's right ear, while another experimenter would whisper a number into his left ear. Hans was then asked to add those numbers together. When the two whisperers knew what each other's numbers were, Hans got the correct answer 94% of the time. When they didn't know each other's numbers, he didn't know either, and Hans got the correct answer just 9% of the time. Side note, when Hans didn't know what to do, he would often just reply with the number 3, so sometimes he got correct answers just by guessing his favorite number. <laughs> 
There are lots more experiments like this, and you could actually check them out for yourself because Oscar Funkst wrote an entire book about Clever Hans. It's called Clever Hans, The Horse of Mr. Von Austin, and it's honestly one of the best books that I've ever read. And according to the book, after the experiments, the solution was found in the unintentional minimal movements of the horse's questioner. Using a variety of methods, such as using blinders on Hans, they were able to confirm that he was carefully watching the movement of the questioner's head. In fact, Hans was so focused on this that he often paid little attention to the objects that he was supposedly answering questions about, in favor of craning his neck to get a good view of the questioner. He often didn't even bother to turn his ears towards the questioner, just his eyes. Specifically, the movements he appeared to be watching was of the tilt of the person's head and upper body. According to the book, if the questioner retained the erect position, he elicited no response from the horse, say what he would. If, however, he stooped over slightly, Hans would immediately begin to tap, whether or not he had been asked a question. It is easily understood, for as soon as the questioner gave the problem, he bent forward, be it ever so slightly, in order to observe the horse's foot the more closely. Additionally, the experimenters noted that the more the body was tilted forward, the faster the horse would tap. The signal that Hans was waiting for to stop tapping was an upward motion, such as a jerking of the head or a raising of the eyebrows. Although this signal was often extremely small, after the experimenters took note of it, with a little practice, they could get Hans to stomp out any number they wanted him to stomp. You can actually find videos of people teaching tricks similar to this to horses on YouTube. I've linked a couple of these videos in the description. Apparently, Mr. Von Austin had no idea that Hans was picking up on nonverbal cues and genuinely thought that he had taught the horse. Although, after finding out the truth, he continued to perform with Hans, and he forbade the scientists from conducting any further experiments. He told Mr. Funkst that the purpose of our inquiries had been to corroborate his theories. In other words, he was mad that he wasn't right about his horse. But even though Hans was not actually understanding and answering questions, he was successfully tricking humans into feeding him for stomping his foot, which I would argue is pretty darn clever. This effect, wherein nonverbal cues give rise to behavior, especially in animals, is sometimes called the Clever Hans effect, and it shows up in other places too. In dogs, this shows up in drug sniffing, wherein the expectations of the dog handler are disproportionately fulfilled by the dogs because they are reacting to subtle signals. What this means is that the drug sniffing dogs are more likely to indicate that drugs are present if their handler thinks that drugs are present. What we can learn from the Clever Hans effect is that if we want to understand how animal minds work, we have to be careful when testing them, because they can get hints, not from reading our minds, but from reading our bodies. Ah, so the horse is a mind reader, eh? Getting my brains.